Welcome, welcome back, Brooklyn Basement Podcast. Willie Sweets is with me, of course. As my always, always. Cody in this podcasting thing. We just made a year, by the way. In when? case you didn't know. When? Uh, I think last month. Okay. <laughs> Congrats. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah. The only thing harder than having the idea is being consistent about it. Right. And I've been finding it. Congratulations. Out. Oh, my God. Thank yeah. you. That's no joke. Yeah. yeah, congratulations. And just so you guys know, the gentleman speaking here is our guest today. He's the director of the film Betrayal at Attica documentary, right? Mm hmm. Mr. Mike Hole in the building. Uh, director, uh, producer. Let's do the imaginary hand clap. 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 We, <laughs> we, we obviously can't afford any other extra equipment right now. <laughs> We're working on our future film. You know what I mean? So we got nothing. So. Michael Hall. Thank the you great Michael Michael I use the here. applause track from I Love Lucy when I need Duh. fake applause. Pretty much everything with applause, and they use the same, like, they even the, the laugh tracks are the over same. And over and over From, like, the 60s or whenever. But you it was. didn't realize it because the show only played once a week. So, but when yeah. you play them back to back, yeah, it's pretty. It's the same one. Yeah. Mike is in town. He just had an event for the celebration of the 52nd. Is that a celebration? You know, it's celebration kind of is not usually the word we use. We, you know, we use the word memorial, memorial, but but it's not always, you know, there's always more to it than just a memorial. You know, right. it is important to remember the, the people that died, you know, both on September 13th, 1971, who were murdered by the state and the people who've died since then for various reasons, but there's still several of the guys alive and right. we've organized the Attica brothers foundation over the yeah. last year. And, you know, they're doing a lot of work and they have a lot of ideas. And so it's never just a memorial. It's always a memorial, but it's never just a memorial because this was the worst day of their lives. And, you know, some of them don't want to come talk about the worst day of their lives. Right. Some of them want to talk about what they've made of themselves since and what they want to do, you know, with their future. Right. And so part of, Remembering that event is remembering that it was a struggle and it was a fight and it was, you know, a rebellion mm -hmm. that is ongoing. These guys are still fighting Tell against you. racism, fighting right. against bad prints. And, you know, they're still in that fight that they were in 52 years ago. Right. So that it is a memorial and some. To backtrack a little bit, you know, marks the 52nd year of the day where the prison is in Attica. So uh, the way that I always describe it. The sentence that I use for the movie and for everything else, on September 13th, 1971, the state of New York shot and killed 39 of its own citizens, injured hundreds more, and mm. tortured the survivors. That's the, sen you know, that's mm -hmm. the sort of like, that's as, as like concisely as I can right. possibly, you know, write it in the English language. And Wait. they killed a lot of black and Puerto Rican men who were prisoners in the jail, but they also killed 10 of their own employees because they didn't care about any of them. You know what I mean? Like none of the lives in the yard actually mattered, whether it was the 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 inmates or even their own guys. They were there to make a point and if they had to sacrifice, well they did sacrifice 10 of their own people to to make that point and never apologized for it after. How does the riot begin? So the the riot happens on September 9th. And in the Attica family, we don't call it a riot. We call it a rebellion. But there was a riot right. in the morning that quickly became a rebellion, right? And the difference is that, like, a riot doesn't have a medical station. A riot doesn't have a latrine. Right. A riot doesn't have a negotiating table. A riot doesn't have votes. You know what I mean? Right. Like, that's a rebellion, right? But in the morning, it was a riot. So in the summer before that, there had been guys organizing, and they had, they had made a manifesto, and they had sent letters uh, to the, the, the warden, to the commissioner of prisons, to various, you know, sort of state representatives, you know, um, stuff like that. And their complaints were several. There was, you know, the prison is way, way, way upstate New York. Everybody who works there is white, Ev mm -hmm. without exception. Every person who works there is white. The vast majority of the people who are actually imprisoned there are black Puerto Rican, almost all of them from the city. Well, I was listening to someone said it was about like 70% of the inmate population was people of color and then yeah. only 30% were white. And that's, and, and, you know, it was also, and, and there were lots of, so there were, you know, there was a lot of political consciousness at the time mm -hmm. and there were several Muslim inmates, you mm -hmm. know, um, and, and sort of, you know, nation of Islam and sort of break offs like that. Right. right. You know, like black Muslims, right, right. you know, and then, you know, like I like the all the Puerto Rican people in there, there's no all the ju the the guards and everybody who works there is white. None of them read Spanish. So if you get a letter in Spanish, they just throw it in the trash. 
because they can't like read it right. and censor it, right? So if thirty percent of the prison is Puerto Rican conflict. people from the city, and you can't get mail from your mother or your wife, you can't. Right. You know what I mean? Like. How long are you going to do that before you become frustrated? Yeah. Right? They got all these Muslim guys in here, and there's pork on the menu every day. Like, How long are you going to do that before you become frustrated? Right? right? Those are some simple things. Also, these guys are working in the metal shop, right? They're, the state prisons of New York are making $3, 4000000 million a year selling the things that are being made because they're making like desks and stuff like that right in the metal shop and then they sell them to the state agencies right mm -hmm. so they'll make a desk and they sell it to whatever you know right and they're making three four million dollars a year those guys are getting paid six cents a day to work in this metal shop that's crazy the highest you could get paid was 29 cents a day and only white prisoners were getting that like even at twenty nine cents or less a day, they're racist as fuck about how yeah. they about how they apply it, right? And everybody there knows it. It's not like it's a secret to anybody. Now you work in the metal shop every day. It's one hundred four degrees in the metal shop during the summer. They got one shower a week. One shower. You are expected to wash your drawers and your socks in the sink in your cell. You can like send your like shirts and pants uh -huh. and stuff off, but you like wash your drawers in the sink. You get one shower a week, one roll of toilet paper a month. So they they said they were on basically a sheet a day plan, like one sheet of toilet paper a day. And you could buy toilet paper at the commissary, right. but you don't make enough in a day to go buy a roll of toilet paper. I mean, like, this is what I'm saying is like when you put if, if like everything else in your life is fine, mm -hmm. but this one thing, OK, maybe you're going to, you know what I mean? But like over the course of. They, they wouldn't allow them to get newspapers. You know, you could get, you know, the, the Post, but you couldn't get, you know, any of the Harlem newspapers. You wow. know, you can't get the Amsterdam News. You know what I mean? You can't get, like, you can't, I mean, you can't get books, like I said, already in Spanish. But, like, not just, like, can you, you know, even in, I mean, even you can't get English translated. You, you can't, it's just so restrictive. And I don't have to explain to you how... White people enforce that. Right. It comes with a lot of condescension. Right. It comes with a lot of, of insults. It comes with a lot of bullshit and a lot of fucking beatings. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it, it's like, it just, and this is why you have to sort of tell this shit correctly because it's like these guys ride it over bacon. Right. <laughs> like, no, 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 no. You know, like, yeah, right. And, and you, you slowly but surely you build this up and you think about being in that cell. And the only time you leave the cell is to, you know, go to the metal shop or to the laundry or whatever. And you come back. Now you did eight hours in this 100 degree laundry. And you got to come back, wash your socks and drawers. It, it, it lights out. You know what I mean? It's just like you think about like what that is day after day with these guys. Right. So. In the summer before, they a bunch, you know, they there had been there was a sociology class because it's the prison is divided into four into four yards, four sections, blocks. And if you're in B, you can't go to D. If you're in A, you don't know anybody in C mm -hmm. because everybody goes to the mess hall with your block. You go to recreation with your block. You don't see anybody from any of the three other blocks. And that's on purpose. The prison is designed like that to keep everybody and how many people you know, was in each block, more or less? A little more than 500, 500, 600. They're supposed to be, I think it was built for 250, 300. So it was already, you know, Overpopulate. but it's, a, it's around five or 600, I think, in each block. Mm. It might be a little bit more, but I think that was about it. And, and you, and, but there was this sociology class and anybody from any block could sign up for the sociology class. So the political guys... The black Muslims, the young lords, you know what I mean? Right. Like the, the guys who were in there with the consciousness already, they all signed up for the, the sociology class. About a few months later, the teacher gets paroled, but they keep the class, right? Mm. And now there's one guy in there, this guy named Eddie, who is part of a, you know, who had like a couple of college classes. And he mm. got busted on a heroin charge, and now he's in there. And they basically sort of let him keep running 
the class. But he wasn't actually running the class. He was just like the guy that had the key. Right. You know what I mean? Right, right. And then like once they would get in there, there's all these guys that have a deep political consciousness and they're all in there talking. And this is white guys, black guys, pouring. Like this is, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? This is a, 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 a mixed group. And they make a list of 28 demands. And it's a lot of the stuff that I've been talking about. Right. You know, more than yeah. one shower a week. Fuck's sake. You know what I mean? More than one roll of toilet paper. It's, you know, stuff like that. And they make this list of demands. And they send it around. And they have Eddie, who has access to a typewriter, right? Because he's got the key. So he's the one that... So mm. he takes this list of demands. And he goes and he gets the copy paper. And he types it up. And then they send it out to Arthur O. Eve and to Tom Wicker, to a bunch of different media people and government people around the state and say, like, these are the conditions in this prison and these are the things that we need to get fixed, right? right. Well, they also send one to the warden, this guy Mancusi, and you know, mm. I mean, he didn't think that shit was funny at all. And they also sent one to Oswald, who was the commissioner of prisons. So Mancusi was a ball buster. Oswald had come from, I think, Minnesota, and was like, you know, a good, like, proper, like, Midwestern white boy liberal. Right. And, like, saw this list and was like, these seem like reasonable demands. You know, like, I can't do everything all at once, but these seem like reasonable demands. And he actually had a positive reaction to it, you know. And so he, he engages with the guys over the course of the summer. Not as much as they would have liked, you right. know. But once he, like, actually settles on this thing and says like okay these are reasonable he starts trying to talk to the governor and he starts trying to figure out how to sort of do some of these things nobody else is feeling it but he's continuing to sort of try and then they kill george jackson but you know he's a very well-known political prisoner dissident and and, you know and he was also you know pretty thuggish i mean you know he wasn't this is not you know Hmm. he didn't go to prison for nothing you know which not everybody you know, who sort of tells this story will tell it that way, you know, but nonetheless, like, yeah. was it revolutionary activity or was it robbing a truck? Right. You know what I mean? But, you know, when you speak on prisoners, some people might be like, well, they're in jail or what would they expect? But one of the guys that I saw in the documentary was a 19 year old kid who was just there for parole violation, who was from a, like a joyride or something. So he took not his every, neighbor, he took a girl out to a date on his, in, with his right. neighbor's car. So not everybody in there as most would think they're like serial killers. You I know, mean, they, this they, is, they, this is the, there's 1,281 guys in right. the yard during this rebellion. 1,200. You're telling me every one of those dudes is a stone cold killer. Right. Right. No, hmm. no. You even if you it. are a stone cold killer, you're locked up in fucking jail <laughs> for the rest of your life. Don't I mean more than one shower a week is, is like, that's a safety precaution for the COs. That's what I mean about all these little things right. yes. that just pick away at a person. Why would you want to piss these All guys this off? unnecessary yeah. shit is not just bad for these guys. It's dangerous to your guards. Yeah, yeah. And this is another thing that is uh, sort of not a part of the story a lot of times is the same over the, over the course of the summer while these guys are, are making these demands and trying to work all this stuff out. The guard union is trying to is about to call a strike because they feel like they're not being paid not over money they I mean you know they're not getting paid as much as they would like but they're they're about to call a strike over safety conditions because they know that they, they just keep it. clamping down harder and harder and harder on these guys and they know some shit's going to go down so then George Jackson gets killed in a prison in California and that's a whole story of its own that I'm going to I won't even get into right now but I actually got contacted a couple of weeks ago by a lady who wants to do a documentary about that. So I may very well be working on that story mm-hmm. pretty soon, too, which would be great. But he gets killed, and he's well-known as a prison activist. And when he gets killed, all the guys in Attica go to breakfast the next day, and none of them eat. None of them take a tray. None of them take any food. They've all taken black material and wrapped around their arms. And they all come in, and they sit for their entire meal period, and nobody says a word. And the guards lost their shit. Because this was black Muslims, this was Latin kings, this was white boys, Mm -hmm. this was everybody. This wasn't a gang thing, this wasn't a racial thing, this was was a prisoner. If you were an inmate... Send a message. If they can organize that... Yeah. hmm. There's no telling what can happen Okay, so that's in August, right, 1971. Basically, after that, 
uh, they just, you know, they just tighten the screws, tighten the screws, tighten the screws. You know, it's little things. You're not supposed to wear a hat. It's not a big deal. Well, now one day, it's a big deal all of a sudden. So now it's a reason for me to bust your balls, if not crack your head. Something that I that you did yesterday in front of me, and I didn't say nothing about. Uh, now today, it's a problem. Right. You know what I mean? And so that ratchets and ratchets and ratchets. And then on September eighth, the guys are out in the yard, and there's two guys who just basically start wrestling. And they don't got no beef. They're not actually fighting. They're just wrestling and, and fucking around. And one of the guards sees them and thinks they're fighting and comes over to break up a fight. And thinks it's a problem and is being a real fucking dick mm-hmm. about it. And the guy, the other prisoners come around and sort of circle him and say, like, no, 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 there's no beef. They weren't fighting. Everything's good. Leave them alone. And one of the prisoners punches one of the guards in the chest. Mm. At that point, the guards are mad. But they're feeling overwhelmed because it's like two guys in this yard with you know, a yard full of guys who are all now concentrating on you. And so the guards go back inside, let everything settle down. So now everybody feels OK about it. They feel like they got a little victory. You know what I mean? But like it's actually kind of good a for them. retaliation behind that. You already know. You already know. So. This is so this is September 8th. So then that night when everybody everybody goes back inside, everybody goes back to their cells, everything is locked down. They send five, six guards to one of the guys who was wrestling. They open up his cell, they beat the shit out of him in the cell, and then they carry him out. And when they carry him out, they're literally carrying him out. There's guards on each one of his le- you know, legs, arms, well, they're they're literally carrying him out. So everybody thinks they just killed him. You know, they at least knock I mean, knock yeah. him cold. They carry him out, they take him to the box. Right, they're locking him up in solitary. Everybody's mad. They come back. They do the same thing to the other guy who was wrestling. Well, now everybody knows what's going on. So everybody's screaming and yelling. Everybody's making a thing. So when they come out to carry the other guy, he wasn't actually, they didn't actually have to carry him. He was walking. They didn't do him as bad as they did the first guy. But as they're bringing him out, and part of it was because everybody was screaming and yelling, and they knew they didn't have the time. They, you know, mm-hmm. As they're bringing him out, one of the guys who's in one of the, the cells throws a full soup can and hits one of the guards in the head. So now one of these guys got punched in the chest, and now one of them got hit in the head with a soup can. Well, that's not going to stand. So they come back and they, right? Yep. So now it's like everybody's on edge. And so then the next day... They send that company out and, you know, that same block goes out, you know, goes to breakfast. And it has been decided that because of all the shenanigans the night before, they get no rec time today. They're not going out in the yard. Now, just. Right. You see what's happening here? You know what I mean? Like, think about this summer, man. It's fucking summer. It's yeah. been hot, you know. As yeah, as I do. Yeah. That everybody gets working all day for six cents. Everybody's <laughs> mad as fuck in the hot anyway. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? Like yeah, it's yeah. just like you can just feel all of this fucking happening. Yeah. And then they're coming back from breakfast. There's two companies, so there's seventy guys in this hallway in the A block hallway coming back from breakfast, and they send this guy Curtis, who's one of the fucking hard noses, fucking one of the CO most ball busting COs in the whole joint. And they send him down basically to enforce this no yard thing. And when the guys figure out that they're not getting any fucking wreck and Curtis is being a fucking dick about it, they beat the shit out of this guy. (laughs) Okay. And so the riot starts essentially in that moment. Yeah. And they know, you know, again, as you've as you've pointed out already, they know that they're not going to do this without consequences. Right. This is like, you know, ready for war. But what have we just been talking about? The squeeze. After a while, like everybody's yeah. been in a fight. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like even if you haven't been in a physical fight, you know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. you know how it like. And by the time you're actually like, fuck this. Yeah. Like you're not thinking right. It doesn't matter. Let's go. It's, you know what I mean? Yeah. All yeah. of that is sort of out of your head. So by the time they're beating Curtis, it's done. They like they're all they they've had everything they could take. Right? So now, but they're still contained in this hallway. They're all in this all 70 of them are in this one hallway and there's bars on either end. So there's no reason to think that I mean that you can all just as far as they're concerned, mm-hmm. you can all just beat the shit out of each whatever. You know what I mean? Right. Like it can all be it's still contained. But in the, at, the, at one end of that hallway is what's called Times Square. As far as I know, it's still called Times Square in Attica to this day. 
And and so if you think about it, it's divided into four. It's it's in like a cross. So you think about the center of the cross. That's Times Square. And right there is a guard station where they've got all the, the switches to every cell in the whole building are all located in this one place. And the, the idea is that, you know, when A Block is going to lunch, they can, you know, one guy can sit in there, open up all the A Block doors, open up the sort of, you know, gates as they go through them, reclose them. You know, so you've got guys actually with them. But the guy who's actually in control of all of that mm. is in his own little cage by design. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like so they even if they fuck up Curtis in the hallway, there's still like the guy over here who's actually in control of the gates is still Chilling. safe. Right? <laughs> so they all go to the gate right before right at to let them into Times Square and they're all shaking on it and screaming and, and you know and what they're actually yelling for at that moment is just to let them go in the yard. Wow. They're still just yelling yeah. at the guy to let him go out in the yard. They're not like trying to start a fucking riot. They're not trying to break into Times Square because nobody knows that there's a deficient weld. One of the welds, like this gate had apparently broken at some point before and nobody's, as far as I know still, nobody knows when this weld was done. But apparently this gate had broken before and somebody welded it back together, but they didn't do a very good job. And then it got painted over for 40 or 50 years so nobody, whoever did that weld, most likely long dead. You right. know what I mean? Nobody has any idea. But it's like, my understanding is that it's, you know, it's in one of the bars that's like cemented into the top and it's, you know, a, about a foot down or so. I don't know exactly. But so these guys are all pushing on this thing and eventually that weld breaks. And when that weld breaks, it gives them enough leverage and there's enough guys that they can just push the rest of the door down. But at this point, none of it was just planned. It was just nothing all, was ever planned. Everything's just reaction to the things. Nothing that are going was ever on. planned. If you see the list of 28 demands that they sent out, which is what some people point to as planning, they say in the thing, we're not trying to be dicks. We're trying to do this whole thing democratically. We're appealing to your humanity. We're not even talking about a strike. They weren't even talking about going on like a work strike in the metal shop or anything like that. Right. They wanted to keep keep it moving because, you know, they didn't want to sort of undermine the whole thing. So, like, that doesn't sound like the plan for a riot to me. Right. But when you got 70 guys out here who haven't had a shower in six days. Yeah. And now you're not going to let them out in the yard after last night you beat the shit out of two guys. You know, the whole day they're asking, like, where is Ray Lamori? Is he dead? You know what I mean? Like uh, where, it, you know what I mean? They're yeah. asking for this guy. And Curtis is like, it's none of your fucking business. And like, again, this is around the time where the other guy was in the other prison. It's, it's kind of like all, all this, this tension. Just, and and so then when everybody's pushing on the thing and it breaks. Nobody expected that. So what do you do now? See, you know what I mean? Like, just open, think about yeah. like if you're in that hallway in that moment. What do you do now? You have access to every gate in the joint you know exactly what you're doing <laughs> what are you gonna do you open up all the floodgates <laughs> everybody you know we go saying? home <laughs> everybody go home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the thing is like when you when you tell the story that way and when you think about all that stuff and when you put yourself in that situation mm. are you right. gonna have the presence of mind to be like nah guys i'm gonna finish my sentence mm. everybody went fucking nuts everybody went fucking nuts and that's the point at which it's a riot. They open all the gates. Right. Right. And they start kicking ass. So mm. basically, when you dissect it all, all this stuff could have been avoided, you know. 100%. That's several well, stages. At the end of the day, pressure bust pipes, and that's what they yeah, did. Yeah, literally. Yeah, busted up gate open. That's what it did. Busted up gate open. Yeah, yeah. I can't sit here now. In this beautiful basement. Very beautiful. After having just broke yeah. bread with everybody and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. And pretend like somehow I am some sort of you now, know, you evolved compare, being who would have been able to sit in that hallway and meditate. Right. Now, when you compare you know, this basement to Attica, which one looks better? <laughs> <laughs> I prefer are it they, here. I prefer it here. You sure? Uh, <laughs> well, there are some similarities, right? There are some similarities. The food is yeah. shitty. You yeah. know what I mean? But there's no fucking hacks walking around all this right. joint. <laughs> the great At least doors. we're free to walk around. All right. I think you're right. I think you're right. So the gate is open. Everybody's all going crazy. 
what happens next? And one of my favorite stories is Carl, this guy, guy Carlos Roche, who's one of the Attica brothers who's still around, you know, is a friend of mine. And I've talked to him and interviewed him about this and stuff like that, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and we asked him, one of the questions was asked was like, when did you sort of know everything was happening? And he's like, you know, I saw some people kind of like running around acting crazy. I heard some noise, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? But I didn't really know what was going on. I didn't really think it was that big of a deal. And then I went out and looked at down the hallway and this motherfucker was driving a forklift and breaking <laughs> down gates with a forklift. He was yeah. like, that's when I knew something different yeah. was happening yeah. today, right? Well, I'd never be coming home. <laughs> that's what I mean when I say... We don't call it a riot. We call it a rebellion because and this is what Liz says in my movie. You know, all of this I know from Liz, from Elizabeth Fink, who was a radical lawyer that worked with the Attica brothers for 40 years. This is how this thing landed on your lap, right? This is how I I really got to know all of this stuff. and, And I can tell that story, too. But she, you know, she worked with these guys for four. They called her the coach. Like when she started working with them. She was fresh out of law school. Mm-hmm. And 40 years later, she won the, the civil suit wow. and was the lead, you know, was, was the coach. She started out as so she the her intern, life. you know what I mean? And she spent her entire life and her entire career working on this, you know. She really cared. Yeah. And so, so that's how I know, that's how, where this information comes from. And all this stuff is in the movie. Um, so she, what she says in the movie is it started as a riot and it immediately became a rebellion. And like, I can't say it any better than that. Right. Mm-hmm. And the difference, like I said earlier, a riot doesn't have a negotiating table. A riot doesn't have a, a latrine. A riot doesn't have a medical station. A riot doesn't have a chow line. You know, mm-hmm. like these guys immediately, they all, they all went into DR. They, they took 39 hostages. So a lot of the hostages were hacks now the hacks you mean by some of the COs. correctional officers yeah, right. that, that, COs. W- that were just ball busters in the place and like they took whoever they could take. Right. Some of them were ball busters, some of them weren't. But At they that took point, whoever they like, could take. Yeah. You're either with us or yeah, against us, and right. that's just what it is. That's right. And they also took several civilian employees. So mm-hmm. like, you know, the the like the manager of the metal shop wasn't a CO. Mm-hmm. He was a guy who knew how to manage a metal shop. Well, he managed the one at Attica, but he right. was a civilian employee. He didn't carry a stick and a gun. He didn't have access to the tear right. gas. That, you was know, that, kind of that was his regular nine to five. That was his regular nine to five. There were also like people in the accounting office. You know what I mean? Stuff like that. Those were the guys giving out those six cent checks. <laughs> the, right? Uh, <laughs> I told you I wanted to raise, right? Yeah. Now you got to face me, baby. <laughs> Let me see. Six cents times nine hours times 40. So they took a bunch. They took 39 hostages. And, you know, they knew that. And, you know, this is, again, this is one of those things where it's like, are these guys all innocent? Well, there's 1,281 guys in the yard. They didn't all take a fucking hostage. Right. Hostages right. were taken. Yeah. You know what I mean? Some of those guys out there were genuine criminals. Some of those mm-hmm. guys out there were kids. You know, it is it's like there's twelve hundred and eighty one guys. The fact is there was also there were hostages. Does everybody deserve collective punishment for that? Hmm. You know, I mean right. this is the like again, just like and I'm always trying to think about being one of the twelve hundred and eighty one guys out there. And what the fuck are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? Yeah, it's like like you have How a choice. How are you gonna stop any of this? Yeah, you know what I mean. So then, so these guys tried to bring as much order to it as they possibly could, and one of the first things they did was, you know, she tells the story in the movie about a guy named Big Black, who's you know a very important person in the Attica family. Later, Big Black had a guard that he would bring things into the prison for him, named Tony Scangicomo. Scangicomo got his arm broken in the initial riot. Mm-hmm. So Black got San Giacomo out and like several other of the guards who, who clearly needed immediate medical attention. Mm-hmm. So they took a bunch of hostages. And then one of the first things they did was let a bunch of them out, you know, who needed medical attention that they couldn't right. provide. You know what I mean? This right. again, is that a riot right, right, right. when they're like picking and choosing guys yeah. and saying like, you need to go to the hospital, yeah. Tony, you know? Right. And, and you know, Curtis, the guy who got his ass whipped in the hall, <laughs> They didn't let him leave. It's we got to talk to Curtis about something real quick. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not all one thing. Yeah. And then something else that doesn't get talked about a lot. Two of the prisoners were, were murdered by other prisoners during the four days. Mm-hmm. They're both rats, supposedly. I mean, that's the story that was told anyway. Two other prisoners, uh, twin brothers, actually, that were both in there, 
very early in the thing were gang raped by several people. Both of them, like, as far as I know, sort of in the same place, mm. even, you know. But this is like in the first like hour or two, right. you know. And as soon as everything started to get organized in D Yard, and the leaders of this, the people who end up becoming the leaders of this thing, found out that two guys had been gang raped, they immediately put a moratorium on drug use, on sexual abuse, on, you know what I mean? Like, they immediately was like, yo, like, if we're going to do this thing, we need to manage ourselves. Right. And one thing we can't do is gang rape white boys. Like, that is not going to work out for us. And not only that, but they took those two guys around the yard and tried to help them find the people that had done it. That's not a riot. And also what needs to be mentioned, all of this stuff is backed by evidence. So Liz went to, to college with my aunt. So I had met her through family, you know, and had known her personally. And then she started, you know, she had some health problems and she needed somebody to bring her groceries and reef her and walk her dog. <laughs> and so my aunt was like, can you take her some groceries and reef her and walk her dog? And I was like, yeah, of course. And then I start going over, every, you know. At least once a week, you know, I'm going over and cleaning up around the house a little bit, bringing her some coffee, whatever. You know what I mean? Just mm -hmm. like trying to like be friendly. You know what I mean? Just be helpful, you know. And she's a great person and she's done a lot of great things and she deserves respect and she deserves yeah. some appreciation. But also then I just start taking stuff over there and she's fucking great. <laughs> you know, yeah. like I ended up really liking her a lot. You know, really just enjoying my time over there. You know, eating Chinese food, watching Serena Williams and shit. And in the course of that, she would talk about Attica all the time. You know what I mean? Because it was important to her, you know. And she said to me one time, everybody makes movies about this thing and all these fucking sad piano music. I'm still mad. I'm still pissed off. Like, mm. these guys are still pissed off. Somebody needs to make a movie that's pissed off. Right. You know? And I was <laughs> like, all right. Like, I don't know how to make a movie that's pissed off, but, like, I know how to make a movie. So, like, I'll make your movie. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, just use me as a tool like you would a pen. Like, I'll make your movie. You know? I'm, I'm, I know how to do this. I work with people who are much harder to work with. I'll do this for you. You know? And she was always like, I don't know about it. You know, I'd have to fucking change my shirt. It's bullshit. She never. She always gave me some bullshit answer about why. But at she this point, you, know. you didn't know all the evidence and stuff that know, she had. I and and also, she's telling me all these stories. And at some point, these stories start to sound like Little she's just been in a bubble for too <laughs> yeah, long. Yeah. And she's sort of, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. So you're like, yeah. Hey, right. And so at some point, you're kind of like, yeah, yeah. I'm sure it was bad, <laughs> but like, you know, six cents a day, yeah. one shower a week. You know, yeah, you're kind yeah, of yeah. having this, like, at some point it just starts to sound absurd. How was nothing ever done about this if all of that is... Right. You know? So I'm trying to get it. I'm telling her, you know, we'll do the thing, we'll do the thing. She keeps telling me no. At this point now, my wife is coming over with me all the time. And my, her and my wife are talking about dogs. My wife is now talking to her about this also and trying to talk her into doing the interview and talking to her about Attica. And my wife is starting to produce this movie. Right. You know, oh, is okay. starting to talk and we yeah. weren't married at that point, but we you know, living together and everything. And like she's talking to her and eventually I was over there one time and Liz said, Okay, if you want to do this, you need to do if you want me to do that for you, you need to do this first. And I was like, For me, I said I was gonna do this for you. But she meant like, you know, if you're gonna do an interview, you need to do this for okay, whatever you want. So walk down the hallway, she opens the closet door. And there's three bankers boxes in the closet. Wow. One of them is full of video VHS tapes. The other two are completely full of photographs. And I don't know what it is. I open the lid and I start looking, you know, I just pull out one of the folders and I just start looking in it. And it's autopsy photos from Attica from after the retake. Then you instantly go, oh, shit. Dude, this is, a, this is one of the guards with a fucking bullet in his head. I mean, it was impossible turn, not to. Right, so you, you know? turn to her like, how the and fuck? And I'm like, what is this, right? Yeah. And this is when she starts to tell me, the state of New York will still tell you that this material, that this shit doesn't exist. But it's been in her closet for 30 years, right? She told me later that I was the fourth documentary director that she had tried to talk to about doing something with this material. And all the rest of them were like, ah, I don't have time. And I was like, this is... American history right. right here. And she's telling me that these are the only copies that exist wow. and that the authority, the people who supposedly own these things will tell you they don't exist. How did she get her hands on it if that's the only... So 
She was the lead plaint. She was the lead lawyer for the Attica Brothers civil trials, which went on for 28 years. Mm -hmm. And the reason it went on for 28 years is because the government did everything they could to stall it and to not give them anything. And so she keeps telling the judge they still have all of these pictures. They have this evidence. I know they do. You know, I think it's here. I think it's in this warehouse. I think it's in that warehouse. And the judge, who's a complete dick, he's an elfin. I, there's a whole other podcast about that asshole. He basically thought that, there, that nothing existed. As far as I can tell, he thought that it had all been destroyed. And so finally, he was like, fine, go look around. Do whatever you want. Because he thought she was going to be wasting her time. All right? So she starts going to state archive buildings, but she's not necessarily going to like go through every box. Like Liz is an organizer. So she goes in and starts talking to people. Uh, and before too, so too long, she's like, where's the Attica shit? And they're yeah. like, oh, it's over on 12. You know what I mean? Like yeah, she yeah. starts to organize. She's and work. She starts to work with people. You yeah. know, she's an organizer, you know? So she eventually, um, this uh, World Trade Center, they had a because you know World Trade Center was state offices for a long time before mm -hmm. you know they didn't have commercial clients right. always you know so she ended up finding this stuff in the in the World Trade Center and she basically like had one of the people as far as I as far as I know the story she had people who worked there who she had organized and had mm -hmm. worked with she basically had them pack the shit up and mail it to her office wow. and just sort of. Like, not really put a label on it. She has every bit of... Someone? No. There's no reason to believe it's everything. There's no uh, reason at all to believe it's everything. It's enough. It's everything but she could find. But the stuff that's in there, the stuff that's but in the, the documentary... But the stuff it is, is insane. It's insane. It's because insane. if you had just told me the stories without me watching the documentary, I'd be like, oh, it sounds and that, good. That's what I was saying. It feels like she's in a bubble. Yeah. And then I start... So so I I find this material. She gives She shows me this material, and I just put as much of it as I could put in my backpack... She's in Brooklyn. I was living in Washington Heights at the time. You know what I mean? Like, I can't comp all these boxes, right? But I just put as many of the pictures as I could in my backpack. And I was working at CBS News at, like, the sort of global news, CBS News hub on 57th Street at that point. And they've got all the video processing tools in there. So I take some of the VHS tapes, too, because, I mean, that's it's thousands of dollars to digitize yeah. all of those tapes and i found out later they a bunch of them were fucked up like there was a lot of like it was 25 it was probably twenty five thousand dollars worth of work just to process those vhs tapes but i could do it for free because i had a union job at cbs and so i would finish all my work you know 10 o'clock friday night the news is done you know what i mean it's the middle of the night in europe that's we're doing news for europe and japan as well as blah, blah, blah. so you know i'm eating a salad, doing the crossword, watching the Daily Show, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. so I could do those tapes. That was another just sort of like window in time where I could process all of this stuff. So yeah. I, I got a scanner, you know, a photo scanner, and yep. I start doing, and I had to learn how to do like, you know, museum archive quality digitization work and all that kind of stuff. And it was all true. Everything she said was true, and there were pictures of all of it. And of course, we don't want to give everything away because, you want to watch the documentary, but one of the things when I was like, wow, this is really fucked up, was watch, seeing some of those pictures where the before and after where they were planting, you know, some of the uh, evidence on the on the victims after they were there to say, this guy tried to attack us with a sword or a knife mm -hmm. or when in actuality he wasn't even there. They were just beating and killing people and, you know, just Big Black, that was his name, right? Big and, Black, uh, yeah. Frank Smith. Seeing what they did to him and torturing him for four or five hours and stuff like that was... Some of the most impactful stuff, there's photos of him laying on a picnic table. And this was a story that he always told. And it was, again, one of those things where it seemed like an exaggeration until they found photos. He's laying yeah. on a table, he's completely naked, and he's got a football under his chin. Mm -hmm. Okay, you think about a full football. You're trying to hold with your between your chin and your chest, yeah. you know what I mean? And they told him, if you drop that football, that's it. And so he's laying on this table, butt naked, and they're throwing cigarette butts at him. They're putting out cigarettes Shh. on him. They're, they're hitting him. The whole time, he's got the football. Yeah. So, like, well, I put this cigarette out on you. Don't drop the football or right. I'm going to cap you in the fucking head. Shotguns, you know, da da da, right? These guys brought personal weapons from home. They took their name tags off before they went into the yard. There's snipers all over the place. 
They drop tear gas before they go in. That's how they ended up killing so many of their own guys because they're just fucking shooting shotguns into tear gas. Yeah, they shot. I mean, over like it 4, can't be more rounds. reckless. They shot over four thousand rounds in like six minutes. That's insane. And so, so after all of that, while guys are dead and and fucking bleeding all over the place, they they make everybody take their clothes off and they start running them single file into a corridor. And a corridor, they have now they've gone along and they've shot out all the windows. And so a corridor is completely covered in glass mm. and everybody's naked and they got to go run through this hallway full of glass oh, with hacks on both sides, just fucking cracking them. And they're running barefoot across glass. I mean, like this is like that's like the climactic shit of Die Hard. Yeah. Like the worst thing that happens yeah. to him in that movie, in this Hollywood movie about a man who is tortured. The worst thing that happens to him is just one of the things that happened to these guys. And they're getting fucking cracked in the head the whole time as they're running down the hall. Right. Yes. And don't fall down. <laughs> in the meantime, while all of that is happening, Big Black the whole time is on that table. He's on that table for four hours while everybody else is going by and running the gauntlet and all this shit. They didn't take pictures of that so that they could, could be used in a courtroom against them 25 years later. They took that picture because they wanted to show it off to their friends of what they did. Because hmm. everybody who was taking pictures was all state police and, and COs and shit too, right? It's not like they let the New York Times in there. Yeah. But, you know. What do you think they found all those like, cameras or pictures? No, they had. I mean, this was... they. So it's also there's also in the movie, there's over an hour worth of of videotape material. Like, I don't know if you know, they had video tapes in 1971. I, I, I fucking did. Until I watched the documentary, I'm like, wait, how the fuck they had I cameras over there? And you see this guy, you know, because I've seen, I've seen photos of the guy with the camera, right? He's got this, this little video camera and it's got a, a big wire coming out of it. And he's basically got a VCR on a oh. strap around his shoulder. And so it's like a, this camera is like plugged into basically what yeah. we would think of as a VCR, you know, yeah. something that we would have in the 80s. You know, what like I mean? his hard drive. almost Exactly. Like big but he's got this big ass thing on his side. And mm -hmm. so it's, you know, and I'm sure a lot of it was battery. I'm sure, you know, the, mm -hmm. I mean, because it doesn't take that much space to record once you've got the tape material. Right. I didn't know they had video cameras <laughs> in 1971, but the state of New York had one. Pretty clear, too. It wasn't and they like... gave one of the hacks. And so he's filming. St oh. And what they were trying to do was film evidence of crimes. And what they filmed was just a bunch of guys having meetings. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, if you look at most of the footage, like I used some of the more dramatic stuff from like right during, you know, when the, the tear gas comes down and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Because the other thing is they recorded all 4,000 shots. You can't see anything because of the tear gas, but you can hear them. And so that's all over the movie. I use that obviously all over the movie. That's yeah. from the 1971 video camera. So the photographs, the video, all of that stuff was they were attempting to collect evidence of crimes. And the only thing I can think of when you're talking about like the big black photo and all that kind of stuff is that they were proud. Just like I was saying about pride, because the only crime happening here, you're doing <laughs> it's like you yeah. guys are the one committing this crime. And this guy's butt naked with this football. Like, there's no way to misunderstand what's happening. You can see a line of naked dudes right in front of him. It's obvious who's in control at yeah. this point. There's no question. The only crime here is being committed by the state. So they didn't take that. Unless maybe you think one, because I'm not going to lie. There has been times when I've looked at these pictures so much that I started to think, like, somebody here got a conscience. Somebody with a camera had a moment that was like, this has gone over the fucking top. Because yeah. some of these pictures, why the fuck would you take that picture? Right. If I find you, I come here, I'm so happy to see you, and I come in and you're laying there fucking butt naked with your dick in your hand, vomit coming out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. My first idea isn't going to be, let me take a picture. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like it's well, not. Well, then again, some of these new kids—the way they doing stuff. <laughs> Back then, no, but now I don't know. I think you might be wrong. Maybe I'm a little older. My yeah. first reaction would not be let me Have share. Have you been this on Instagram lately? Because I'm sure this is pretty regular. I would go viral with vomit <laughs> yeah. all over my chest. Right they look now. forward to those moments now. <laughs> that's the, that's yeah. the, no, you know what the sad part to me watching the Doc was? The prisoners that died with their hands on their head already. 
like yeah. was just dead like this on the, with I mean but that means naked. I'm coming in peace. Then I, I'm, I'm but I die like this on my back with the, my still hands on my head. So you know, right? They was just trying to just. They give were never up a sense a of threat, threat was, to, yeah. to get shot to begin with. That's crazy. at that moment at least, you know. And the guard that bring the shotgun in that was a illmatic. Yeah. The guard that gave shot prisoners fight faces off, and yeah. they went back was like, oh look, they have fucking shotguns in prison. I so the guy. There is a there is a guard named Aldo Barbellini, mm-hmm. and he brought his own pistol, and I believe he's the one that shot Kenny Malloy's eyes out. And you can see this picture. Right. One of these guys, he's both of his eyes have been shot. None, none of the rest of his face has been shot. Somebody, now, when you're going through these pictures th- to put them in the movie, do you think like, man, should I put this or because? Oh my fucking god! Every day I have this moment of like, should I even? Yeah. You know, because like this guy still has family, right? They may be in this fucking block, right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think that I've thought that so many times. There's also a question, as I'm working on this, of white people making black trauma porn and going yeah. and making money off of it. You know, you take all of these cops killing people and all this kind of shit, and you're going and, and, and turning that into content for yourself as a white person. What analysis are you bringing to the table that we actually need? Right. What are you getting paid for here that is actually providing something to the world? Or are you just continuing this, this thing of this is what happens to black people? See? We've yeah. been mad about it for years. Keeps happening. Guess there's nothing we could do about it is sort of the ultimate end of that conversation in a lot of ways, right? Like, I work with a lot of black people. I work on a lot of criminal justice stuff. I do, you know, I do protest work. Like, you know, I do volunteer work for black-led peace organizations. Like, mm-hmm. <clears throat> I'm in this conversation deeply and how to participate in racial justice as a white person. Mm-hmm. And it's not, you know, it's a it's a complicated conversation. Right. It's not an easy and obvious conversation. And there's no doubt that the movie that I'm making here is a bunch of white hacks killing a bunch of black people. And I got the pictures and I'm going to make you fucking looking at them because I'm a- thinking about this a lot. But the, the only thing that I can do now is talk to the Attica brothers because Liz passed away before I was able to make the movie. Right. So the only thing I can do is talk to the Attica brothers. You actually knew these guys. Mm-hmm. You actually got shot in that yard. You watched these guys get shot. These were your friends. You know what I mean? So if anybody's going to make that judgment. It's them. Right? right? This is the conversation I'm having with myself and my yeah. wife. But that's the conclusion that we came to. If right. anybody gets to have an opinion, it's not fucking Instagram. It's the guys that got shot over there. And to a man, every single one I talk to every single time I talked to them, said, make everybody look at everything. Mm -hmm. We've been trying to get motherfuckers to look at this since 1971. We've been trying to get people to look. Make them look. Because as a filmmaker, you got to... As a filmmaker, it's very exciting. I got all this new shit nobody's ever seen. It's bloody as fuck. As a filmmaker, separated from the fact that these are our neighbors. You also, as a filmmaker, you know what it's going to take for it to have an impact, in a sense. For the movie to be like, oh, like it did for me, like, oh, shit. It has Versus, to be pissed off. Right. Liz so was right. you kind of have to be unfiltered in a sense. So, you know, that's what I'm saying. I couldn't really imagine what it was for you at that time between having a conscience and thinking about family and also, especially the fact that people are always going to be like, eh, I don't know. You, you got to paint the picture all the way. And that's, I guess, the decision you made. Uh, ultimately. Yeah, that painted for me. It painted the picture because I found myself doing, oh, this is effed up, man. Yeah. All throughout the whole, oh, this, oh, that's all. Oh. Like and it made you angry, so you 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 hit Liz in the head by doing exactly what she wanted you to do. Like, cause it was an, I and, had to stop it. And going back to the, the, the <laughs> rounds of bullets, you when you hear the bullets just nonstop, and you see the 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 mist of uh, the the tear gas coming down and. And you just listening to that and picturing in your mind, there's a bunch of guys there just unarmed, just standing there. It all, it, most of the shots happen in about six to seven minutes. And I play that six to seven minutes uncut in the movie. In the movie. You hear every bit of almost it. all of those shots. And I, I go away in the video. You know, we go and we see 
things you hear people talk. You know what I mean? We go and see some of the pictures of the guys that got shot. We see some, you know, I save a lot of the evidence stuff for afterward. But, you know, some of the, the autopsy photos and stuff like that, we lace it in because you can't just like, it's just, you're just looking at tear gas. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the yeah. video itself is not all that exciting. Yeah. But I made the choice to not cut the audio. Wow, looking at this. Right. Well, this because time. you should have to listen. If I'm going to make you look at everything, you have to hear every shot. You have to hear every shot. The other thing you have to listen to, and the original title of the movie was Surrender Peacefully, You Will Not Be Harmed. But nobody would buy that fucker. Because it was too long. And <laughs> too because wordy. it didn't have the word Attica in the title. Yeah. Everybody wants to be Attica in the title and make it very short. And the guy who actually sold the movie to HBO um, <clears throat> suggested Betrayal at Attica. And I was like, mm, that's pretty good. Yeah. And it has Attica in the title and it's fucking short. Yeah, we yeah. put on a poster, you know. But the reason why I picked Surrender Peace because <clears throat> through like at least the last couple minutes of the shots, you're hearing shots. There's a helicopter flying overhead yeah. with a loudspeaker saying, Surrender peacefully, you will not be harmed. <laughs> Surrender peacefully, you will not. <laughs> Surrender peacefully. So where do you think that Jose Mentijo got the idea to put his hands up, right. to put his hands behind his head? And try to walk toward a hack. Because the helicopter was saying, surrender peacefully. Well, how do you do that? You put your hands behind your head and you walk towards the, the authority figure, right? Right. right. Where did Jose Mentijo get that idea? From that helicopter. Right. Did it matter? Not one bit. That's They killed 39 people. They shot more than 100. Before they were making the guys run the glass and all that stuff. They killed 39 people. They shot more than 100. And then I saw that some of them could have been saved. Had they gotten the proper medical attention? There was no... They had an ambulance on site for every single one of the guards who... For every single one of the hostages. Mm -hmm. They had no medical care whatsoever for any of the inmates. None. And, you know, the other thing is this whole thing was predicated, you know, on... In the initial, when they first broke down the gate at Times Square, the first guard basically sort of between them and, and the Keys, was a guy named William Quinn. And he wasn't necessarily a bad guard, as far as everybody said. He just was the first one. And he got it. And I have the picture of him after he was killed. And it's in the movie. So all these guys over the years have become like family to you as well. The inmates and everybody just involved them on this thing. There is an Attica family. Yeah. I don't know how else to describe yeah, it. Yeah, You know... On September 13th, there were lawyers in the in the parking lot saying, I don't know what the fuck you're doing in there, but you need to stop. They weren't allowed in the prison until September 17th. Two of those people who were allowed in the prison on September 17th were at the memorial this weekend. Right. So like that's literally 52 years that they have been a part of this. And so they met some of these guys who was also there this weekend the, that surviving Attica brothers, they met them that, you know, in that first couple of days when they were going in and they're getting reports from these guys. And this is when they're hearing about the torture. And this is when they hear about big black. And this is when they hear about, you know, this is the first time that, that anybody from outside is hearing any of these stories. They don't know about the photos. They don't know about the, they don't know about any of this stuff. Yeah. They're just meeting with the guys and the guys are telling them. So, <clears throat> so that's like, I mean, yeah, that's a like fifty two years. Yeah. I've known you like twenty six. Right, family. You know what I mean. It doesn't right. take fifty two. You know yeah, what I mean. Yeah. Like, and especially not when their relationships were formed in the crucible of this event. You know, that's the other thing. You know, it's one thing to sort of like, man, it is great to meet you. Mm -hmm. It was a nice fucking dinner. I'm enjoying having a chat with yeah, you about yeah. this podcast and all the Bob Lazar and shit we talked yeah, about before. Yeah. Great, right? You know what I mean. It's a different thing than like if you and I are suddenly in a life threatening crucible together. Yep. It's a different sort of relationship. It There's no way you, you guys can, forever. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like hopefully we don't have to go through some shit like that because it doesn't look fun. But they all did. All these all these folk the lawyers and the and, you know and I mean some of the lawyers ended up marrying some of the brothers after they got out. Mm -hmm. Like there were relationships and children born of this mm -hmm. Attica family, mm -hmm. you know. And so now we're 52 years on, you know, there's like 10 or 12 of the brothers left. You know, we lost 
Charlie Joe Pernasley's this year. We also lost Dennis Cunningham this year. That was one of the brothers and one of the lawyers. You know, we lost back to back already this year. This year's not done yet. You know, right. and so, so it's both sort of the amount of time that they've known each other, the the hard things that they've gone through, but also now they've. You know, they've all seen each other have babies. They've all helped raise each other's kids. They've all, you know what I mean? Like they, and you know, not everybody's friends with everybody, but the relationships that are there are very, very deep. Bill Kunstler was, you know, Bill Kunstler was Martin Luther King's lawyer Mm -hmm. and then went on to represent Black Panthers and, you know, went on to like, was a a real movement lawyer, you know, and and was Liz's mentor Mm -hmm. and several other people. His wife, you know, he passed, he's been passed for a while now. His wife and daughters were at the event this year. Mm -hmm. And his daughters are like. Now, the event that you had this year, that's something that's going to happen every year? Or, because I think you mentioned when we were speaking behind the scenes about the foundation and stuff that's about to happen. There's been private memorials every year. And, you know, sort of every like 10 years or so, they would put together a big public thing. But at this, but then the 50th anniversary, we made a really big deal out of it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like I said, Bill Kunstler's daughter, Sarah, and, and, and Emily were both a huge part of organizing all of that. Sarah's the one that brought me into it, you know, and because her and I worked together on Liz's memorial after Liz passed, you know, because Liz was her mentor, right? Mm-hmm. Like, this is what I mean, man. It's yeah. like, you know, like, this is like, it's not, an, it's not a, 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 a sort of passing thing, you know? Uh, they're raising each other's kids. They're they're bringing them into this yeah. movement. You know, I believed all of this shit until I met Liz, and then Liz was like, "That's great. You're fucking voting for Democrats or whatever. Yeah. Like, what else are you doing with your life? You go to a protest every two years, you know." And I had, fe- you know, like I said, I was an editor for a major, you know, for uh, the World News Hub of CBS News in the middle of the Iraq War, and we're talking about Muslims on TV. I have the choice to show people praying or preparing for war. You know, the the B-roll of black people when I started working there was garbage. It was mm. garbage. It was all garbage, mm. you know? And so I talked to one of the black cameramen and was like, hey, man, all this B-roll of black people is fucking trash, dude. Like, at best, it's like some kids hanging out fucking looking shady by a basketball court uh, at best you know what i mean and i'm like so if i'm doing a medical story so it's always on a negative light. always and so i go talk to one of the black cameramen i'm like well oh, come on you've seen this fucking folder you yeah. know what i mean and then over the next couple of weeks he goes out you know what i mean and now we got some some black kids on a playground mm-hmm. now we got people eating ice cream and shit you know what i mean just yeah. like living life just being human beings you know what i mean yeah we live in new york you can go get that and so now the the black people B-roll folder at this major news hub is dramatically improved. These are the kinds of things I'm thinking about how I'm sort of applying my politics and my feelings in my sort of professional life, right. whatever. You know what I mean? But I'm still like mostly interested in telling sort of my own stories, things that I'm interested in or whatever. And that's the thing is Liz hit me with this. You know, it's a secular version of faith without works is dead, mm-hmm. which is like my favorite christian phrase (laughs) you know (laughs) i love that shit unfortunately it hasn't always inspired christians to productive activity however it's a beautiful notion you know and it's this idea of of it's great to like believe all these things but if you're not Mm -hmm. doing anything with it you might as well just believe anything else who cares you know and 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 i really like that made a huge difference to me you know Mm -hmm. and liz that that family that uh, that is what they do and and once you start coming around these people, you know, yeah. they've been fighting for racial justice and better prisons. Literally, we know it since the summer of 1971. And since the fall yeah. of 1971, they've been doing it together. Cross racially, cross gender, cross whatever. You know what I mean? Why isn't it bigger by now? Your documentary, you know, after watching it, it's like, man, how is this thing not publicized so, more? Let me... T- so... Uh, so we're working right now. One, we started the Attica Brothers Foundation after the 50th anniversary. The 50th anniversary worked really hard. We brought as many of the guys together as wanted to come. Like I said, for a lot of the, this is the worst day of their life. A lot of them don't want to talk about it. They want to hang out with their grandkids mm-hmm. and leave that shit in the past. And you know what? Job less. You know what I mean? Like I'm not trying to 
bother anybody about it if they don't want to talk about it. We're trying to make space for people who do, who who feel the need to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, made a big deal about it in the fiftieth. It was great. Then we form this organization, and now we one of the things we're trying to do with the foundation is to access some of these records, because Heather Ann Thompson, who wrote Blood in the Water, she's you know it's basically the big comprehensive. There's three things that came out leading up to or right around the 50th anniversary, which was Blood in the Water by Heather Ann Thompson, a book that won a Pulitzer, mm -hmm. and Attica by Stanley Nelson, uh, another documentary that got nominated for an Academy Award, and then there's my movie that was just too hard yeah, <laughs> for, for the Oscars. But, it's you not know, for the faint-hearted, that's for sure. But it's if like, you watch Stanley's movie, my movie and Stanley's movie are actually the per are really perfect complements to each other because mm -hmm. all, I interviewed Liz, and then she died, and I didn't interview anybody else. And I made my whole movie around the one interview that I got with Liz and a bunch of B-roll, you know what I mean, and yeah. found footage and stuff like that because that's the kind of movie I like to and like really, make. You almost don't need anything else. Not for the kind of movie I like to make. Right. Yeah. Stanley went and got all the Attica brothers and got brand new interviews with all the Attica okay. brothers hmm. and with Heather Ann Thompson, who had won a Pulitzer for her book. Right. That's a different kind of movie. It's yeah. not more or less valid. You know what I mean? It's a different kind of movie. He not also has a totally different style than me. He has a much calmer style. He has a much more sort of like consider i'm just like you watch my movie and it's just fucking frying pan you, after frying you want pan. some rob zombie because uh, <laughs> i don't want you to ignore or be able to blink or turn away or act like yeah. any of this is, you know he has a much different style so our two movies are actually perfect compliments i'm gonna be honest i probably won't be able to sleep tonight after watching that documentary <laughs> <laughs> this is the hard <laughs> thing about making a movie like this nobody can be like oh i really enjoyed watching your movie no you didn't nah, <laughs> that shit was not fun to watch it, and that's okay it, it, took you know? you it was good it it was good, but, but I didn't enjoy it, it. It was definitely an emotional roller coaster. That if yeah, you're I, not uh, you're not good with the roller coasters, this is not the ride, man. Well, but, now we're trying to. But over, real quick, yeah, do, do you get over the years uh, kind of guys that you weren't aware of coming out the woodworks? Like, hey, also I was there. Here's this little bit of information that I may have. Has that happened in the past recent years? It has, you know, you, we've met new people. This The guy, Eddie LaShore, who I mentioned, um, you know, who was part of the sociology class, he was somebody that he didn't even know anything was happening. And then he mm -hmm. saw an interview that I did on one of the TV interviews that I did for Betrayal. Mm -hmm. He saw, and he was like, what? Somebody's making an Attica movie? Like, who the fuck is this guy? And then he went to the website, and, and I ended up getting an email from this guy, and he said in the email, I didn't know anybody was still thinking about this. Hmm. And I was like, oh, man, we got a whole thing happening yeah. in New York. Like, he's in North Carolina and didn't know anything about it. But at that point, now, he starts that to get involved. Now, isn't that for someone that was in there and to think, like, nobody even knows about what we went through, and he's still alive here. Yeah, you know I mean, and we're carrying that every said, day. A lot of these guys don't want to talk about it. Nightmares and, you yeah. know. 100%. Yeah, that's crazy. One of the guys who's in the foundation, um, a guy named Akil, is just a beautiful, beautiful man, was the only person in the group of people he was with who walked out of the yard that day. He was with the group of people when they actually started coming in, and every single one of the people he was with got killed around like within two feet of him three feet of him all of them are he got uh, shot but he didn't get killed but he sat there and watched four or five of his friends all get murdered around him and then he got um, how can beat you into live a normal life after that what do you do after that how do you walk around in the world after that yeah. and like value life you know what I mean? And now you see this guy and he, he 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 takes stray cats out by his building and he gets them spayed and neutered and he feeds them. You know what I mean? Like he takes care of cats around the neighborhood now. He takes care of like, you know, this is like he go. There's this Carlos is blind. He goes and takes Carlos for a walk because Carlos can't walk by himself. And, you know, and, and his knees are going bad. And so Keel goes and takes Carlos for a walk. Keel's maybe five or six years younger than Carlos, but he's younger, you know, he's got yeah. his sight, and so he can go and guide him around the block. This is a beautiful man who New York City benefits from his existence here. You know what I mean? Like, this city is a better place because he's in it now. How did he become the person he is now after watching all of his friends around him get fucking murdered by the fucking yeah. police? How does he, how did he, yeah. I don't know, man. I don't know. 
And I love him. I saw him yesterday. You know what I mean? Like, this is a person that I like. I can talk to him. I have access to him. I can ask him these questions. I can hear these stories. And I still don't have any idea. Other, I mean, I think that a part of it is when you see something. I think it's that it. I think it's sort of. It's one thing to sort of like think about. Oh, people are capable of terrible things. But when you really see it happen in front of you, it sort of forces you to decide if you're a person who would do that or not. Right. In a way, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, in a way, it sort of makes you think about, you know, that yeah. first time you see somebody beating up his old lady. The first question is, oh, am I going to do anything about it right now? Right, right, right. <laughs> but not very long after that is the question of, am, would I do that? Right. Am I the kind of person right. that would do that? You know, and you make a decision in that moment that hopefully you're able to stick to later. But you don't necessarily walk around thinking about, you know, my neighbor recently got divorced and this guy comes over and, you know, he's telling me about an argument he's having with his wife. And he tells me like, yeah, I broke everything in the bathroom. I broke the toilet and the sink and everything, but I didn't hit her or the kids. And it's like. <laughs> You got to say that out yeah, loud. Yeah, yeah. It was clearly on the table. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I think there's there's some part of me that thinks that after having that experience in that yard that day, yeah. that they had sort of seen the worst. Yeah. And that and that for a lot of them, I think it 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 made them it it gave them a resolve to not be anywhere anything like that. Hmm. You know, to try. And I think also there's just sort of a natural thing of like, it's not that uncommon to be a fucking criminal when you're a kid. When you think you're going to live forever, you think you're right about everything. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're and by the time. It. Yeah, man. You know, and, and over time, you have more to lose. You know, mm -hmm. you Again, have. I think about the, the 19 year old kid that was up there for just joyriding and stuff like that. This guy you're talking about is named L.D. Barkley. And he was from upstate, and he was in 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 Attica on a parole violation for joyriding. He had taken somebody's car, but they called it joyriding instead of fucking grand theft auto because he brought it back, <laughs> right? Uh, and it wasn't fucked up. This was something that was much more common then. Also, you know, something that is, you know sort of like drunk driving or hitchhiking. You know, it's just yeah. something that like we don't even think about now, but it was really common then. So he's 19 years old. He's in prison on a parole violation for something that really shouldn't even be a fucking crime to begin with but once everything started like he was very politically conscious and not only was he politically conscious but it turns out he was an incredible speaker he's one of these guys that like if he could do that at 19 imagine like, like nobody knows you know what i mean like he's yeah. like a presidential level speaker you know mm -hmm. but so as soon as the whole thing pops off he's one of the main guys on a microphone so they let in the news cameras, and he's the main guy on the microphone. We are men. We are not beasts, and we will not be treated as such. Hmm. He's talking, that's literally, I mean, and we will not be driven and treated as such is the literal, like, that's an actual quote, you know, a famous quote of his, right, that he said in that moment, you know. Did he make it up right then? I think he was reading off a piece of paper. Either way, it Either sounded way. amazing. And he delivered know? it. And he delivered it. And so once he delivers this amazing speech, the news is rerunning that shit every day. Mm -hmm. And so there was another guy named Sam Melville. And Sam Melville was a, was a revolutionary, like he was a bomb-throwing motherfucker. Like Sam Melville <laughs> was not a joke. Sam Melville right. did not go to prison on a joyriding charge. Right. You know, right? But he also didn't go to prison on a fucking capital offense. They had the death penalty then. He wasn't right. threatened by it. You know what I mean? Hmm. But they knew that he was a loudmouth shit talker. They knew that he hated cops. You know, they knew all these things about him. And the story is, we haven't actually found the evidence of this yet, but we've heard it from a bunch of guys. And it's the same thing as like the big black story and all these other stories we heard from the guys that the mm. state always said was a lie until we found pictures of it. And it sounded crazy until... The story is that after they made everybody strip and, you know, they made them all take their clothes off and lay down in the mud... Because it had been raining at that point, you know. So they make it take the clothes off and lay down in the mud, face down. And supposedly, several of the guys got a white X on their back. L.D. Barkley was supposed to be one of them. Sam Melville was supposed to be another. 
and there are reports of shooting as late as three, four o'clock in the afternoon. So they well, the yard had been re- had been taken back by ten fifteen in the morning. But these guys are telling stories that there were still guns going off at oh. three or four in the afternoon. And when Sam Melville got carted out, he had point blank injuries. When L.D. Barkley got carted out, he had point blank injuries. And there are people who've said that they've sp- that they saw both of those guys alive after the yard was taken. Hmm. Wow. Which so means the they ex- were murdered. Execution exactly. Which means they were executed after for their politics. Wow. So this is one of the things, you know, you asked about sort of what we're doing now. What we're trying to do now is work with some of the existing lawyers, some of the surviving brothers, with Heather, with, you know, what I mean, with sort of the Attica family and the people that have grown up around this to get more of this stuff released. And, you know, I don't know if it's going to work, but that is one of the things that we're trying to do is to start to find out. Like, don't let me find a fucking picture of a guy with a white X on his back. Right. Oh, because that that makes it all true. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? That makes it all true. The documentary came out in uh, August 1st, 2021. So it came out right before the 50th. Now, since. You dropped that. It's on HBO Max. HBO Max. And you should definitely go watch that. (laughs) Have you been getting threats? You know, I would imagine that some of the people that don't want this information out. You know, uh, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't like, there's much more high profile people to go bother. You know, the thing that I keep getting is like, I got a call from the the guy who runs the state archive of the who runs the archive of the state of New York. This is a very big deal, <laughs> you know? yeah. And none of this material is there. And he says, "You have this material? Yeah, of course I do. Can I have it?" So that's what I mean. It like, would have been Liz's dream to have that stuff in the publicly available state archive. And I was like, "Why? Like, why are you asking me for shit? You should right. be giving me shit. Like, I just want to ask you for things." And he basically, he didn't, you know, it was sort of, he didn't say it, in the, but he basically said that he's been told that if he, the only way he can have this material is if he can get it from a third party. Which isn't to say they don't have it. It's to say they won't give it to him. Uh, but because I, you know, he, he was like, can I, will you give it to me? Mm-hmm. I'll pay the fucking postage. Are you kidding me? <laughs> like, yeah. yes. We need this out there. This, so <clears throat> there's one other very personal part of this story, which is that I was supposed to do four interviews with Liz. I did the first interview. The day we were supposed to do the second interview, she called me that morning and she said, I'm not feeling well. I can't do the interview. Can you still come over? Mm -hmm. You know, whatever. You bring her some, whatever. Whatever she needed me to do that day. No problem. We postponed the interview, but I'm still going to come through. But now that I know that we don't have to be there on time. You know, we're not meeting the camera. Mm-hmm. We have time. The time is not important. So my wife and I, you know, take a shower, get some breakfast. You know what I mean? Like, we take our time, okay? Mm-hmm. By the time we get there, the dogs had to piss. So she takes the dog out for a piss, which was one of the things we do. You know? Now, she takes the dog out for a piss every day. I'm not the only one. The dog's not waiting four days for me to come back. Yeah. Right? You know what I mean? But this day, we were going to take the dog. She, the dog can't wait. She takes the dog. While well, she's taking the dog, the dog, like, runs after a squirrel or something and pulls her. She falls. And she breaks her hip. And so by the time my wife and I get off the train, I got a message from one of the Attica brothers, Al Victory, Who's like, hey, Liz is in the hospital. She fell and broke her hip. She's in the hospital. I'm at the hospital with her. You know, she told me you were coming over. This is where we're at now. <laughs> Basically, like, wow. nobody's going to answer the door at the apartment, right? And this is one of the Attica brothers, and it's one of the guys that I had known that I met in Liz's apartment. So we go to the hospital, and she's there, and Al is there. And she's holding my hand, and she says, promise me you're going to put this shit on the internet. Because that was a conversation her and I were always having. And she was always like, you know, can you put it on the internet? And I'm like, yeah, I can put it. The hard part is digitizing all of this shit. Once I've got it all digitized, putting it on the internet's not actually the hard part. Right. You know, but that was the part that she really didn't sort of know how to do. But I'm, she's like, I don't know if you've ever held a dying lady's hand in her fucking deathbed and made a promise to her. But mm. I did. But, you know, uh, and the promise was to make this material available. Yeah. 
And that's why I put the movie in it. I sent a bunch of the pictures to Heather Thompson. I sent a bunch of the material to Stanley for his movie. You know, I digitize this stuff. In theory, I could say I own it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But I've made it all public domain. I got a lawyer to declare it all public domain. I told the state of New York, hey, I'm making all of this public domain. You know, and it has been radio silent. I haven't Wait, heard. So she's in the hospital for a broken hip. She's How in she the hospital for a broken hip, but her, you know, she her kidneys were in terrible shape. She was supposed to have been on dialysis by that point. Mm. Her heart was in terrible shape. Uh. My the way I heard the story is that she from is that she basically died on during the operation, and they like her body like couldn't grabbed her surgery. heart with their hands and like brought her back. And after they had done that twice, her family was just like too much and so she 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 was physically you know already unwell she needed to be on dialysis for quite a while at that point this hadn't been going any chance that there may be some other stuff she never she didn't get to give you yet because i guarantee it i guarantee it and as well as like i said we had three other interviews scheduled right, so there was a I'm whole thinking. lot of shit that we were meant to talk about and i had already like planned out my questions and like yeah. we were going to talk about this and so the the interview that i have is the event that's what i have right. we didn't get to the legal shit we right. barely got to the 30 year legal effort you know 30 years and so that's and that's a lot of what i'm doing now is interviewing other lawyers and and trying to really collect the rest of that. Yeah. And it took 30 years for them to finally settle the government, right? And they settled for... So they, so they had the initial trials. And, like, Big Black was awarded $4 million hmm. in the initial trial, mm -hmm. right? Like, they, you know, they gave... I mean, they, they, it basically, like, if they would have actually paid out what was owed in the after the initial victory right it would have been billions of dollars mm -hmm. and four million to black alone like he was the highest he was the most tortured he was you know what i mean right. but like people who were killed their families were going to get money you know what i mean the whole thing right and that got appealed by the state and the next league the next judge or whatever said you cannot sue as a class it's not a class action. Uh, what's the technicality? So uh, the technicality is that everybody wasn't injured in, to the same degree and in the same way, which means that now 1,281 guys have to sue the state as individuals. Wow. This whole thing, this whole 30-year process has been done by five lawyers. Those five lawyers can't represent 1,281 mm -hmm. guys as individuals. They could only represent them as a class. So after that, judgment got vacated it basically the state of new york the sort of people who run the courts in the state of new york hmm. acknowledged that the guy who had been running this whole thing was doing everything he could to keep it from getting settled and so they wanted to get it settled so they ended up settling for 12 million dollars black got i think two hundred thousand or something like that instead of four wow. million Eight million of the twelve of the twelve million went to the the brothers, and four million went to the lawyers, um, to to sort of not just to those five lawyers, but to sort of the legal effort in general. The four, you know, the five lawyers definitely collected some of that. Um, wow. And then, from what I understand, Liz gave most of what she got away <laughs> to the brothers. You know, how long after the settlement did Big Black pass away? Just a couple years. He passed, I think. Yeah, it wasn't very long. It was less than five. Here's, here's the other thing. You want to know how these people are fucked up? How you know they're fucked up in their fucking soul. Not just in their actions, but in their soul. The way you know that this state and the way they handled this is a mess. After the brothers got that settlement, the remaining hostages and the families of the hostages who were murdered, they called themselves the forgotten victims of Attica. It's pretty hard to argue with them. They've never worked with us. They don't, they don't mess with the Attica brothers. They've ne you know what I mean? Right. They don't have none to do with us. Right. Nonetheless, it's pretty hard to argue that they weren't put in a bad spot by the state. Before mm. the whole thing, they were already complaining about it. Just like there was a list of demands from the Attica brothers, their union had a list of demands that all revolved around their safety. After those guys got killed, 
The state went around to their widows of the dead hostages, and they gave them checks for $100, $150. They gave them workman's <laughs> comp checks. And when they went and cashed them, these, one of these ladies is now the single mom of six children. And you give her a check, she bought groceries with that check for a week or two. Mm -hmm. And then when she tried to come back and fucking ask the state for more, and when they started threatening a lawsuit, 70s, the state said, oh, no, 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 you were already compensated. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they signed those, yep. those checks meant that they signed away their right to ask for more than a week's pay now that their husband is gone. Only one of those women didn't sign the check because she asked a lawyer, and he was like, mm, that doesn't seem like a good idea. Yeah. She got like a million dollars or something like that. Which still doesn't... From well, the state later. Yeah. Which, like, you know, all right, are you going to raise five kids by yourself and lose your soulmate over that? Like, no, no most people aren't going to make that decision, right? No. Nonetheless, if, you're, if it happens, you'll take a million over 150. Right. Yeah. That's what I mean about it. they're rotten in their fucking soul. These are the widows of the people that you hired and then put in that position and then went and murdered. And you're going to do that to them, too. It's like it's one of those things where, like, it's a little bit easier to wrap our heads around because of history that these black and Puerto Rican guys in this prison are not going to be treated well by the state and, or, or nor their families. It's a little bit easier for us to just uh, to like say, like, well, that seems normal. But when they also go and do that to the widows of the white guards, like there's literally nobody matters. You know what I mean? Like at least a racist loves somebody. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. Like yeah, has yeah. some love in his heart for his yeah. own people. Yeah. At yeah. least if you need a silver lining, yeah. these motherfuckers got nothing for nobody. Hmm. And that's the thing, man. Like that's part of that's like fighting this fight and having this conversation at some point does actually grow beyond the Attica brothers. Now we're working with, with the Alliance of Families for Justice on a campaign that's just shut down Attica. Turn that shit into a museum. You know the prison that Nelson Mandela was in for 20 years? Yeah. It's not a prison anymore. It's a museum. You go there and you learn about how bad apartheid was right. at this place where they jailed people under apartheid. Right? That's what we're trying to do to Attica. We're trying to turn Attica into a museum of the abuses of mm -hmm. the American policing system. Is that going to happen? I don't know. But mm. we're working on it. And Alliance of Families for Justice is working on it. And they're, you know, they're working together with us from the foundation. We have the guys who were in the yard that day. But Alliance of Families for Justice has dozens of people who've been in Attica in the last 52 years who will come out and tell you there's asbestos all over that place. The water is not safe to drink. The food's still garbage. They got, you can get letters in Spanish now. But, yeah. <laughs> like, that's good you know what i mean but that's like up. but like this idea that somehow they learned a lesson after 1971 also you know the changes that have been made have been made as a direct result of the struggle these guys went through and you know that because the changes that have been made are the things are some of the things that they were fighting for Right. So, you know, where they didn't get those fucking ideas on their own. They got them off of the, you know, from this fight. Right. Yeah. But the fact is that fight has been carried on by three successive generations of guys who've been locked up in that place and who are coming out now and who have been saying for years, this could happen again. If, you know, if there's another faulty weld. Because yeah. all of the things that made this happen haven't changed. Now when you read these, you know, because like there's been prison strikes in, in Alabama. There's been prison, like there's prison strikes happening all over this country. You asked, why don't we know more about this? The reason why don't we don't know more about this is because they, they this, still won't let us see any of this evidence. Why now, 52 years right. later, does it matter? Nobody's getting charged for any of this shit at this point. They're all dead. Who cares? Why right. do you still care? The only reason you still care is because it proves the point that black people have been making in this country since Frederick Douglass, at least, since they were allowed to write things down. Hmm. They've been making this hmm. point, right? Since there's been Puerto Ricans in this country... There's been this conversation. You want to talk to Chinese people about their history in this country? It's going to sound a lot the same. You listen to certain Irish people, they'll try to tell you they had the same experience. Like, they don't want to have that conversation because it proves them wrong. 
you know? And this is one of these things where, like, you know, you start talking about shit sounds crazy. You start talking about conspiracy theories. Yes. Like, do they really care? You know, there's no threat to anybody who's alive. The only thing there is 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 things to learn here. But the things that there are to learn are the things <laughs> that... Mm -hmm. The they people who run everything don't want you to know. Like, you want to say they? Who's they? Yeah. They is the guy who's the head of the fucking guard union at Attica. That's who they is. Hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. They is successive governors. A governor after governor after governor, Democrat and Republican, who've been asked to, you know, to, to work with this information and have refused. <laughs> you know, it, when you say they, I don't mean they like... The Republicans, right. the white people upstate. Mm. I don't mean that. I mean the power structure. Right. And how you know it's real is when you see Pataki and Cuomo do. Mm -hmm. they when you see <laughs> Democrats and Republicans go and start wars, <laughs> that's who they is. They is Eric Adams that doesn't want they to close is, Rutgers Island right now. They the fuck for is the Eric, same, Ad yeah, for the Eric same Adams reason, is they. For the same reason... He don't want to close right, Rikers Island right now. Is the same reason why he's talking. They don't want you to know what exactly is going on because there's money to be made in prison. Prior to this documentary, did you have a passion for this type of work, or did this kind of wake that up? I had a, I had a lot of these sort of feelings about policing in general. I didn't have a lot of knowledge about prison specifically. I had, you know, f just from friends who have been in and stuff like that. You know, heard especially sort of stories about. Just condescending hacks and shit, right? right? And now we sort of know, like, I mean, what is it? NWA talking about black police showing out for the white cop, right? About right. every now and then mm. you see, you know, people of color in the force and they go extra because they've got to make their point to their boss or whatever. You know, there's sort of that thing now. If you're not subscribed already, press that red button. It'll cost you no money. This is the Brooklyn Basement Podcast where we talk real shit. And when you press subscribe, it helps us in the YouTube algorithm so you can see us more often. So press that web button because we need you to do that shit. Like right now, please. I know that you have a podcast. Are these some of the topics that you touch on in the podcast? One of the, So I have two different podcasts. One of them is called Black Diplomats. And I'll tell you, you'll enjoy it. You'll like this story. One of the podcasts I speak on, one of them I don't. Like I actually talk on the podcast. The other one I don't. Black Diplomats, I don't actually talk on. I just produce that. I do all of the, mm -hmm. the editing and the audio work. And, you know, I do all of that sort of behind the scenes work. It's all hosted by a guy named Terrell Starr. And he's a black guy. He's from Detroit. He's black as fuck. And I don't mean, I mean, complexion, but not just, you know. Not just complexion, yeah. culture, you know, sort of the way his politics, the way he thinks about himself, the way he carries himself in the world. I think he would agree he's black as fuck. So when I met Terrell, we met, we were working together on the, uh, at one of these news stations on the 2016 election. So we met in 2015, leading up to the election. So I'm out of town a lot at this job. I'm, around, I'm driving around, you know, I'm flying around, filming activists and all that kind of stuff. So this day, I'm back in New York, and I come into the office. And the office, our part of the office, the political team, you know, we got one of these long tables, you know, this 20-foot mm -hmm. table or whatever. There's a bunch of chairs on either side. You know, everybody sort of sits down, does their laptop, whatever. I come up to the table. Like I said, I'm not in town very often, so I'm not in the office all the mm -hmm. time. I come up to the table. Every chair is taken. There's a sweater over the only empty chair. That means this chair's taken. I am not getting the fuck. I'm fucking working. I'm busy right now. I got shit to do. There's nobody in the chair. That means don't I'm busy. sit on this fucking chair. Okay. It didn't even occur to me. That actually is relevant to the end of this story. I pull the sweater off. I put it on the uh, table. I sit down. I start See, that's working. that privilege. <laughs> Have I told you the story before? No, no. I'm sitting there doing this work, right? And then Terrell, the guy who I make Black Diplomats with, comes in. And I don't even see him. He just comes behind me and he grabs a sweater and he says, just like a white man to colonize my shit. And he picks up, by now there's like <laughs> yeah. five chairs available, you know, he did not right? Picks up his sweater, walks around to the other side, sits down, starts working. Yeah. I immediately and I, and I, started laughing. That shit was hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was a very solid point. Yeah, yeah. Historically accurate. <laughs> Timing was fantastic. Yeah. You know, it was perfect like delivery. Everything about it was perfect, dude. Yeah. And I just started laughing. And I was like, you know, Mike Hall, I'm sorry. You know what I mean? And I immediately apologized. And he could tell that I was laughing at the joke. He could right. tell that I was like, he didn't hurt my fucking feelings. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. After that, they sent me out to to basically sort of do camera training with him. And I guess he had been sent out with some other producers before who were sort of short and condescending. Oh. And, you know, they sent him out with me. And he and I just, like, from day one, he's great, dude. This guy's mm -hmm. great. 
Mm. You'd be like he's he's not he needs camera training. Mm. But his like his 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 political sense, the way he sort of approaches the world, is amazing. Mm-hmm. Right? It's called Black Diplomats. It's on any sort of podcast uh, thing you want to look at. We're about to start a YouTube channel now because this is a guy who grew up all his uncles selling crack, mm-hmm. '80s Detroit, bad as it can be, becomes a scholar. He joins the Peace Corps, graduate degrees, all this kind of stuff. And he joins the Peace Corps because he's going to go to Africa. He's going to go be black in Africa. And they send him to Georgia, like the country. Right? They send him. This is literally in the Caucasus. Yeah. These are actual Caucasian people. Yeah, you know? yeah. And they send him to Georgia. And he's like, I don't want to go to Georgia. It's all fucking white people over there. And they're like, hey, you don't get a pick on your first run. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Hang around. Maybe you'll get to Africa yeah. next time. But like for now, we're sending you where we need you. And where we need you is in fucking Georgia. So they send him to Georgia. And he gets to Georgia. And all these white people keep telling him they're the black people of Africa. Or of Europe, I mean. <laughs> and how do you hear that? Yeah, all right. You know yeah, what I mean? Like right. he's immediately sort of skeptical about it. But then he starts talking to people. And they are telling him stories and speaking the language of oppressed people. Because if you think about where they're at. Right. They have been run over by the Russians and then run over by the right. French or the Germans and then the Russians and then the French and the Germans. And then at some point the Mongols came, right? They have been historically oppressed for as far back as people have been writing anything down. People have been going there right. and saying, now we run this place, right? So they can speak the language of oppressed. These people lived through in right. the Soviet Union. I mean, you think the fucking LAPD is bad. Think about the NKVD. Like, those guys didn't have any rules. Like, they could send you to Siberia. You just disappear. That's it. You know, it really is. Like, it's a sort of, it's, a, it's an oppression that most people in America can't even conceive of. Obviously, like, we've been talking about oppression in America for the last fucking two hours now, right? It's not like, you know, it's not to sort of diminish that. Right. But the fact that you can be sent away to work camps and, like, I mean, it just... It just existed over there in a way that we can't even imagine. Even, you know, we had legal lynching. We, you know what I mean? There was, we had a different way of doing it. They had a sort of quieter way of doing it, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. they did it. Stalin starved millions of people. You know, St- I mean, there's something that was called the Holodomor in Ukraine where Stalin intentionally took all of their food and starved four or five million people. In Ukraine, right? Say what you want about Franklin Roosevelt. I mean, maybe he shouldn't have run four times, but he wasn't starving people because they might not vote for him next time. Well, he probably didn't do that because he knew he couldn't get away with it, maybe. I mean, no, I genuinely don't think so. I genuinely think there's a difference between him and somebody like Stalin. You know, I genuinely think there's a difference between... Winston Churchill, who definitely was a racist shitbag that hated Indians and Africans, but, uh, you know, versus a Hitler who not only hates gypsies and Jews and everybody else, but is completely comfortable putting them in camps and, and gassing right. them and so on and but so forth. People like that think they just felt like they had the ultimate power because... You know what I mean? Like and they, they felt justified and they felt right. They they I can't have believe no I'm one sitting here defending, like somehow <laughs> holding up Winston Churchill as a good guy. Like this guy was Those, a terrible human being who yeah, definitely murdered a lot of these people. These guys but. just felt like they had no one to answer to. But I mean, I, like imagine if, you know, in the 1930s, you know, Franklin Roosevelt just decided that, you know, they that California needed the wheat and so he just decided that all the states in the middle of the country were just going to have to starve. And everybody right. who lives from North Dakota to Texas just doesn't get to eat this year. I mean, it's like it's yeah. on a level that we can't imagine. And in, when we hear about it again, it sounds like bullshit. Yeah. These are the stories that Terrell, my black friend from Detroit, who's black as fuck, like I said, is hearing from these white people. When he goes to Georgia and at some point it becomes sort of undeniable. Mm -hmm. And he starts to develop this sort of international consciousness against oppression and against Mm -hmm. colonialism. And the Soviets didn't call it colonialism, but it certainly fucking was. Nobody else in the Soviet Republic got to make any decisions for themselves. Right. You know, it's not even like they had the sort of states rights that we have in our republic. 
Hmm. Everything was coming out of Moscow. And so he starts to develop this international consciousness that in some way collects, connects the struggle of black people in Detroit with the struggle of Caucasian people in literally from the Caucasus in Georgia. And that is a concept that sort of existed in especially black communist revolutionary thought in the 60s, right? Mm. 50s and 60s. Terrell doesn't think about any of that shit, doesn't reference any of that shit at all. Doesn't talk about Paul Robeson, you know what I mean? Doesn't talk about the whole history of this thing because I think he developed this consciousness on his own. I certainly know that the way he describes it is his own, you know? And so in the meantime now, the next time, so, so in the meantime, he starts going to Ukraine and he makes all these friends in Ukraine, right? This is 10 years ago. You know what I mean? He makes all these friends in Ukraine and he learns about the Holodomor and he, you know, he meets black people in Ukraine and because every now and then the Soviet Union would bring black people to Russia to be like, look, America attacks them with hoses and dogs. Like uh. we bring them here and, and, and give them degrees. You know what I mean? And that was true. Right but right. they brought like, you know, a few thousand black people. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was it was a poster. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. wasn't really a program. They certainly weren't upsetting the racial dynamics of even right. one of their towns or whatever, right? The black people there remained s sort of novelties in a way that black people are not novelties in the United States. Right. You know? Nonetheless, many of them stayed there, had kids got married now there are black people who've lived their whole life in ukraine who've never lived anywhere else you know we don't really think about that we just black diplomats we just did a series about iran the last episode we talk about black people in iran because iran had african slaves and so now they have the descendants of those slaves who live there you know it's one of these things that like it's not something that very many people are sort of thinking about but it does exist so he falls in love with ukraine and mm. and with people there and he ends up spending half his fucking life there anyway, you know, and then in the lead up to the war. He's already there. He's mm. already got people over there. He's already got friends over there. He's already got contacts over there. And so we started interviewing people from Ukraine in the six months before Russia invaded. And every person we talked to was like, no, they're going to invade and we're going to beat the fuck out of them. Um. And it sounded ridiculous. But it they were ready. Insane. They were with it. Before the invasion happened, it sounded crazy that Ukraine was going to be able to, to hold their own. Because look what happened in 2014 when Russia went into Crimea. They didn't, there was no fight back at all. Right. Okay, the fact that there was no fight back in 2014 upset the Ukrainians so much that they kicked out the fucking government, brought in a whole new government who promised that they would build up their military so this would never happen again. Hmm. This is what's happening for five, six years before the invasion of Ukraine. Nobody here knows anything about it. But right. everybody we talked to for six months before that invasion told us exactly what was going to happen. And I'm sitting there interviewing, like listening to these people and editing these interviews. And the whole time I'm like, mm, I hope so. <laughs> because it was obvious he was going to invade. He's got 100,000 troops on the border. You don't put 100,000 fucking troops anywhere for no reason yeah. except to use them. You didn't move all those guys there to not use them, you know? Hmm. And so when the invasion actually happened, when they actually finally did it, we see what's happened. Hmm. The Ukrainians fucking held their own. And obviously, you know, we've given them a bunch of weapons now because they'd be out of bullets and mm -hmm. out of guns. And you know what I mean? Like they wouldn't have the same sort of material things that they have now hmm. if we hadn't started helping them. Mm -hmm. But we don't have boots over there. No That's European, right. none of the NATO countries have boots over there. That's all Ukrainian people who are doing that work. You know, and so when all of that happened, Terrell was already there. He already had contacts. He already had people. So the next thing you know, he's on CNN every night hmm. from Ukraine. The next thing you know, he's got 100,000 Twitter followers. Wow. The next thing you know, he's on MSNBC every night. Hmm. The next thing you know, he's got 200,000 Twitter followers. You know, the next thing you know, he's writing for the Washington Post about it. The next thing you know, and you know, this guy, he'd already written for the, you know, Times for, you know, he was the lead political reporter for The Root for many years, right. you know, spent a lot of times with Stacey Abrams and stuff like that. And, you know, it's amazing to hear the interviews that he does because he's so used to being a black person in America and being reported on uh, hmm. and, and people getting it wrong. And that was part of what motivated him to be a reporter and to be a journalist 
was to tell black stories correctly, hmm. you know? And like, and so now that he's there and he's seeing the exact same patterns happening to Ukrainians hmm. that he saw happening to black people in Detroit in the 80s and 90s, he knows that he's... He, he also knows how to report this stuff in the way where it's highlighted in the way that it man. needs to be. He's great. Yeah. He's, like I said, he had a whole f beautiful career. I loved working with this guy before any of this happened. Before we sort of ended up in this situation where like all of his sweet spots, you know, sort of yeah. come together. And the fact that he has the language and then he has the relationship. So now we're, we've are we been doing the podcast. So it was a good thing you, you took know? over that sweater in the chair that day. Dude, <laughs> that sweater was the... Not getting butthurt about the fucking joke was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> was the real it was also it. good, you know. Man, Mike. All that's... I'm really... You know, it's one of those things where, like, I'm... Because he and I haven't worked together in an official new, news organization yeah. a long time. And then he tweeted about six months later, I'm thinking about starting a podcast. And Light I responded bulb. on Twitter... Hey, man, I know how to make a podcast. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? And like that has developed into, you know, the relationship has deepened. But we've also I mean, we've produced a lot of really good shit. That's awesome. You know, it's something it's like it's work that I'm really, really proud of. I want to say that that documentary was so powerful to me. It made Thank you. such, such, such an impact. We'll share it here, of course. Next year, when you're going into your your third year of the podcast, I'll 30, come. Yeah. I'll bring a bunch of these Attica brothers. Oh, that'd down be here. awesome! Yeah, yeah. That'd be crazy, bring right? some Attica brothers to the base. We'll have metal detectors in case you know. <laughs> you can hear the story <laughs> firsthand. <laughs> you know, that'd be great, though. But Mike, what we always ask is for our guests to look into the camera, and you know, just kind of say how this is the best place you've ever been to. You know, it's beautiful and the Brooklyn know. basement is literally my second home. <laughs> when I need to get away from my wife and children mm -hmm. and have a few minutes of calm, the Brooklyn basement is where I come. I'm not making a joke. Hopefully it's funny, <laughs> but it is also actually true. I've slept on that fucking couch <laughs> more times yeah. than you can imagine. Yeah. The Brooklyn basement is a beautiful and comfortable place. We appreciate you once again. Yes, thank you, Will, Michael Hall. Yeah. Wrap this up for us. Another great episode, of course, with the great Michael Hall. Thank you for coming, man. Wichita, Kansas. He didn't even mention where he was from. He didn't tell you, right? <laughs> Wichita, <laughs> Kansas. <laughs> is in the building, man. Thank you, Michael, for coming through. We appreciate yes. you. Watch the doc, man. Watch, Watch the, the doc. It's Betrayal on HBO Max right now. Max right now. And Betrayal and Attica. Shit, it's been on for a while now. I've been telling people for a long while. Hoping that it didn't go off because that's how they did us on Netflix with smokers. They did, yeah, yeah. Well, they and you can up. catch Will in his they feature threw us film. Up. I was on Netflix for a while talking bad shit. Yeah, watch Netflix. <laughs> talking that shit until the shit just disappeared. Yeah. They was like, you're not on Netflix, buddy. They don't believe you. They don't believe, <laughs> they, they don't believe you. We gone. were once upon a time. We were once upon a time. But yeah, we're here at Brooklyn Basement Podcast, man. Thank you for tuning in. Um, Michael Hall, of course, the great AR. Thank you for tuning yes, in. Yes, sir. Peace. Thanks, Peace. guys.